were partners in marriage and in business. We had 6,000 square foot home. We drove Jaguars. He had four Rolexes. They were a really good team. Danny had an eye for design. This man was the next Picasso of interior design. And Donna had a head for business. Donna was the brains behind the business. But their partnership would come to an explosive end. Got shot him. She shot him? He was shot three times. One of the shots traveled completely through his body. Donna admitted pulling the trigger. But was it a case of self-defense? He pointed the gun at me. And his fingers started moving, and I raised the gun up and I shot him. Or was it a cold-blooded revenge killing? She actually recorded his last moments of him dying. Breaking his wedding vows. That was the end of him right there. January 12, 2004. At 3.25 a.m., the 911 dispatch center in Louisville, Kentucky, received a call reporting a domestic dispute at the home of interior designers Donna and Danny Fryman. But the caller wasn't Donna or Danny. My wife is on the phone with her sister, and her husband has a huge drug problem and he's freaking out. The caller was Matt Zender. His wife, Gail, was on the other line with her sister, Donna Fryman. And according to what Matt and Gail relayed to the police, Donna's husband, Danny, was in the middle of a drug-fueled rampage. Something really desperate was going on over there. I could hear him in the background cursing. She said, come without sirens, though, because will freak out before, you know, before you get... OK, you see, got, is there any weapons or anything in the house? I'd say, yes, there is weapons in the house. Hoping to defuse the situation before things got out of hand, the dispatcher tried to route officers to the scene. But at that critical moment, he ran into trouble. I'm not finding the street in the computer. There was some confusion of where the emergency responders needed to go. And as the seconds ticked away, the situation suddenly, drastically changed for the worse. Matt tells 911 to get there, you know, as soon as you can. She shot him. She shot him. I shot him. She shot him? Gail jumped in her truck and sped to her sister's house. 45-minute drive takes me about 15 minutes <laughs> to get to where I'm going. And I pull up, and there's, uh, there's three police cars there. And they tell me to stay back, but human nature, I can't stay back. She stepped into the foyer, calling out to her sister. I say, Donna, are you OK? And of course, she says no. And then I ask Danny, Danny, it's Gail. I'm here. Are you OK? And uh, he doesn't reply. And at that point, they pull me back. Gail could only watch as an officer escorted Donna out and placed her in the back of a squad car. He didn't handcuff me, put me in the back of the car, made sure I was warm. But then the ambulance show up. From the squad car, Donna watched as paramedics rushed inside to her husband's aid. I'm sitting there, you know, just in shock. And I'm thinking, please don't bring him out in the body bag. Donna and Danny Fryman met in high school. I was a freshman, he was a sophomore. We met in study hall. And it was, I guess, kind of love at first sight. Soon, the headstrong freshman and the shy, artistic sophomore were inseparable. We dated all through high school. I went to each other's proms and was just bestest buddies and bestest friends. Having grown up in a broken home, Danny embraced Donna's close-knit family. My dad and him were father and son. My whole family, aunts and uncles, just took him all in, loved him. He took me under his wing as a big brother and was my softball coach. And, Gail, you have a science project? All right, let's do it. The couple married in 1986, not long after Donna graduated from high school. I'm a secretary, and he's loading trucks. We got an apartment. We lived there for a year, and uh, then we decided we wanted more out of life. So we moved back in with mom and dad in a little apartment over their garage. The couple made ends meet by selling clocks out of Donna's parents' garage. 
People were like, if you, you know, build them, uh, why don't you work on them? Donna and Danny responded by opening their own boutique in 1996. Within just a few months, the money started rolling in. We were doing very well. We were getting ready to build a house. Not just any house either. The inside became Danny's creative outlet. I knew that was his passion. It was kind of just a, a venture, something for him to kind of test out um, because it was going to be our home. Danny was a very talented artist. He, he had a lot of uh, things I think he had bottled up inside for 30-something years. He designed many of the sofas, the window treatments. This man was the next Picasso of interior design. He was unbelievable. Unbelievable. In 1998, Danny's talents were showcased when the Fryman's new house was featured in a local home show. It's really a big opportunity because they can show all the creativity and talent that they have in one house. We had lines of people waiting to see the house. Ever the entrepreneur, it didn't take Donna long to figure out how to cash in on her husband's creativity. We decided that Louisville was ready for, you know, our design, our way of doing things. In 2001, the couple opened Pizzazz Interiors, a high-end furniture store and design firm that showcased Danny's flair for contemporary design. It was, must have been five, 6,000 square feet, all contemporary furniture, pictures, decorating. The business was an instant success. They were a really good team. Dan was the creative side. Donna handled the books. When we were 30, you know, we had a 6,000 square foot home. We drove Lexus, Jaguars. He had four Rolexes. The Fryman's success did come at a price, however, particularly for Pizzazz's creative genius. He was gonna have to take on a big load with this successful business, then it had already started accumulating. He was working a lot of late hours and stuff, trying to do a lot of the work himself, getting the store ready to open. As the stress mounted, Danny tried lots of new ways to deal with it. When I first met Danny, he did not drink at all, did not smoke, no drugs. But once uh, Pizzazz started, he was uh, drinking a lot to keep himself going. Partying too hard and I guess drinking and drugging one thing led to the other and kind of went downhill. Before long, Donna barely recognized the man she had married. He was wanting to go and get his ears pierced and his hair weird colors and wear like biker clothes. He started having a um, extended ego about the whole situation. Um, it was kind of like it wasn't a 50-50 partnership with Donna and Danny anymore. It was kind of like, I'm the interior designer, and I'm the one that gets all the jobs. Concerned for her business and marriage, Donna confronted Danny about his bizarre behavior. He was losing clients left and right. He wasn't finishing jobs. I asked him, you know, what was going on? You're acting strange. You're not doing your work. Your, your appearance is changing. Um, then he went off and, you know, threw things, just went ballistic. It wouldn't be the last time. We would be talking, and Donna would make a comment that Dan didn't like. He would not say anything or show himself at that time. But then I would look over at Donna, and I would see a scared look in her, in her face. With its star designer out at play, Pizzazz's sales dropped dramatically. And as the business imploded, Donna and Danny's arguments grew more frequent. And he would tell me, Go to hell, um, I'm own business, and that everybody loved it but me. And I was the one that was always wrong. After 15 years of marriage, Donna wasn't about to give up. But then she discovered Danny was having an affair with one of their employees. Breaking his wedding vows. When he did that, that was the end of him right there. In March of 2002, Donna left Danny and the fancy house in Prospect and moved in with her parents. It's really not that hard to explain. I mean, they had a rocky marriage uh, for a year or so. They decided to call it quits. In October of 2002, the marriage was officially over. But just six months later, a sober Danny showed up on Donna's parents' doorstep, begging for a second chance. They came to my mom's, fell in her arms, begging for help. Um, and, you know, I, 
I took him back to help him. Hoping her ex-husband had changed for the better, Donna moved back in and tried her best to put their relationship back together. They'd been together since teenagers. They obviously loved each other and they thought they're gonna try to work it out. But it was too late. The damage was done and the damage extended far beyond their marriage. Pizzazz, the company that had put them over the top, was teetering on the brink of ruin. What took us 19 years to build, Dan Fryman ruined in six months. He shot it up his arm, up his nose, down his throat. By winter of 2003, their home was in foreclosure, and Pizzazz was in bankruptcy. It was just empty. I mean, it, you know, I was dead. On the verge of eviction, Donna's life was a shambles, and it was about to get much worse. January 12th, 2004. It was just after three in the morning when Gail Zender's phone rang. It was her sister, Donna. And I said, Donna, it's three o'clock in the morning. And she said, I know, I know. She said, but I, I just, I need money. And at that point, I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So I'm panicking. According to what Donna told her sister over the phone, Danny was raging through the house, waving a gun around. Your sister and brother-in-law, you know, uh, owe me money, and now I want $800 interest, and you're going to call them and tell them I want my money now. Yeah, I'm going to ride you around and kill everybody. I asked if I needed to call 911, and she said yes. And so I screamed to my husband, 911, get 911, tell them domestic dispute. Just then, the line went dead. Gail's husband, Matt, dialed 911 while she frantically dialed her sister's number. By the time Donna answered, Danny's rampage was over. She said, I shot him. Oh, my God, I shot him. She shot him? You, yeah, you better get there now. She just shot him. Coming up, Danny fights for his life. They're just yelling, stay with me, Dan, over and over. And Donna walks police through the fight that allegedly led to the shooting. He said, if you got the balls to pull a gun on me, you better have the balls to pull a trigger. It was not quite 4 a.m. on January 12, 2004, as Oldham County police drove through the upscale Louisville suburb of Prospect. Minutes earlier, police had received a call reporting a domestic disturbance at the home of interior designers Donna and Danny Fryman. It was this guy's my sister that called. Evidently, she called them and said she was having trouble with him. And then evidently, he had a gun pointed at her. And over the course of the call, the situation had apparently escalated. She got it away from him and shot him. It took the police almost 25 minutes to reach the scene. For some reason, there was some confusion. They had a little trouble getting there. Shots had been fired, so the police approached the house carefully. But once they were inside, the violent confrontation was over. Officers found both guns on the stove in the kitchen. Donna was pacing the floor, while Danny lay in the foyer, covered in blood and gasping for air. He was shot three times. One of the shots traveled completely through his body. The police officers are yelling at Dan just to keep him alive. They're trying to keep him conscious and keep him breathing. And they're just yelling, stay with me, Dan, over and over. And he's fading in and out of consciousness. Meanwhile, Donna's parents had arrived at the scene and joined her sister and a small crowd of neighbors out on the lawn. We just kind of stand back and watch as they take Donna to the police car. Soon after, Danny's brought out on the stretcher. It's just a nightmare. Within minutes, Danny was en route to the hospital, and Donna was on her way to police headquarters. Once inside the interrogation room, she agreed to give a statement, but not just yet. I'm an intelligent woman. I know I'm going to need an attorney. Within hours, Donna and her family had hired an attorney. By then, however, her situation had changed. While Donna was at the police station, Danny had died in surgery. To be honest, um, I don't know, again, I don't know if I was in shock, but I was almost relieved. You know, it's a terrible, terrible thing to say, but I was almost relieved. The police were no longer investigating a domestic dispute. 
they were looking at a potential murder. She had shot her husband and he was dead. So that fact alone is enough usually for a criminal case to begin. At around 11 a.m. on the morning of January 13th, Donna Fryman was back at the Oldham County Police Headquarters. She wanted to give a statement. Um, and in, so I agreed to let her. Even if I hadn't have agreed to, she would have given one anyway. I couldn't shut up. I finally, after two years, really five, but after a solid year of torture, I actually could tell somebody. So I was just, you know, I had nothing to hide. At the station, Donna admitted that she had shot her ex-husband. Donna Fryman never denied she shot Dan Fryman. Always said she shot him. She also told police that Danny had cheated on her prior to the divorce. His assistant and him, you know, had a thing going. So, you know, um, her name's Kim Luckett. She told police that the affair had ended months ago and she had decided to take her husband back. Together all those years, and, you know, he loved me, and I loved him, and I thought I could fix him. But there was no fixing Danny, Donna claimed. He was apparently cocaine user, heroin user, and that the drugs are what turned him into who he was. According to Donna, Danny's drug habit had also contributed to his death. Right, Connie, so, um, come home around 3 o'clock on Saturday, and he would come home and he Donna claimed that after they went to bed on Sunday night, Danny had been restless. I hear him moan, he hates me, and I make him miserable, and why did he ever come back, and all this stuff. And um, so then I, I, I turned kind of over, and I'm like, you know, what have I done? Donna said Danny's response had been to grab his 9mm from beside the bed. He jumps up like on his knee on the bed cocks the gun and just sticks it right in my face. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, what have I done? What are you doing? Where did this come from? He leans on me, grabs my face, and he leans down and he bites me. So then he's like, get out of my face, get out of this bed. Get out of my face. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And so I get up, and I'm like, okay, okay. You know, just don't touch me, don't hurt me, I'll leave. Donna said that as she got out of bed, she had secretly retrieved a 38 pistol that she kept nearby for protection. So I picked the gun up, and I had my flannel shirt, a red flannel shirt laying there, and I, I threw it over my arm. As she headed for the door, Danny demanded that she stop. He grabbed my arm, and he pulled me back. And he said, I'm going to kill you. And he pulled me back, and he said, I'm going to kill and he wants uh, 28 for if he wants interest now. She has one hour to get it to him. Um, or he's going to go over there and kill my nephew. He was out of drugs and, and money. Terrified, Donna said she promptly followed Danny's orders. But as she fumbled with the phone, Danny had caught her with the pistol. My flannel shirt falls off. There, I'm standing there with, a, you know, my gun. He just walks over to me. Looks down, looks back up at me, and just has this grin on his face. He walks behind me, walks behind me, and he takes the gun, and he shoots it into the floor. Then he raises it up, and he shoots um, above the um, fireplace. Donna said Danny then laid both guns down and picked up the phone to talk to Gail. And that's when Donna said she had tried to make her escape. So I grabbed my gun, and I took out the bedroom. But as she darted out of the bedroom, Donna claimed that Danny had come charging after her. According to Donna, he had caught up to her in the doorway of the dining room. He says, Donna. And I turn around, and there he stands with the 9 millimeter. He said, if you got the balls to pull a gun on me, you better have the balls to pull a trigger. Seeing Danny's finger begin to squeeze the trigger, Donna said she had raised her own 38 and begun firing. I 
That night was the last time Danny ever attacked her. But according to Donna, it wasn't the first. She told police there had been plenty of other incidents. He threw me through the back of my uh, Alexis window. Um, he raped me. I mean, he stabbed me up against walls and threw knives at me. It was pure torture. I mean, pure torture. But if she had been so tortured, why hadn't she reported it to the police? Like many abused women, Donna was ashamed, afraid, whatever reason, didn't tell other people about it. According to Donna, there was more to her fear than the simple fact that Danny was an abusive, unstable drug addict. She told police that over the past year, Danny had developed a terrifying split personality. He's having like seizures, and you know, like his mouth, his eyes, his and stuff. And I tried to take him to a neurologist. And it was in the neurologist's waiting room that the new Danny had emerged, according to Donna. This devil personality emerged, started growling and drooling. I was like, what are you doing? You know, if you don't want to see the doctor, just tell me. I looked over at him, and there was something very different. He says that it, it does not want to be x-rayed because they'll be able to notice that he is starting to change on the inside. The way Donna told it, Danny believed he had been possessed by a demon. He's like, Donna, I got to get out of here. And then here comes this demon voice. Well, then he turns into that thing, totally he runs out. He disappears. And as the fateful night of January 12th approached, she said she had seen the demonic side of Danny more and more often. It's kind of far in between in the beginning and then it just, it just escalated. She told police that she had proof. Terrified that Danny would kill her if she tried to leave, she had begun secretly documenting Danny's rampages in journals and on audio cassettes. She became concerned that, you know, this is, this is not something that people are going to believe. So she actually started making audio recordings of these threats that he made. I told him to go get my, my box in my briefcase out in the garage where I had it hidden with all my notes and photos and tapes that it would explain everything. Coming up, Donna's tapes may explain everything, but is it the story she wants the police to hear? Why did you call the police to hear that hear of you? A little after 3 p.m. on January 13th, 2004, Donna Fryman returned to the upscale home she had shared with her ex-husband, Danny, accompanied by her sister, Gail, and the Oldham County, Kentucky police. The house had been a showcase for Danny's eye-catching interior designs. They'd won awards for the house. It had been an event called Homerama, and they'd won several awards just by his designs in his own house. But the house they walked into that afternoon was anything but a showplace. The destruction of that beautiful half a million dollar home was incredible. Holes everywhere, doors ripped apart, papers destroyed everywhere. It was far from being normal in any sense of the word. There was also the crime scene tape surrounding the premises. Barely 36 hours earlier, Donna had shot Danny dead inside their 6,000 square foot home. And according to what Donna had told police, she had fired in self-defense. Donna Fryman told police after she killed her husband, she told him that night she was laying in bed and Dan Fryman came in and there was sort of an altercation and he bit her on her cheek and held a gun at her. And she had come back with the detectives that afternoon to recover tapes and journals to support her claim. And that's why she had the journals, that's why she had the tapes and she was afraid from what she said that if she left him, he would come after her, kill her, and then kill himself. Of course, it was Danny who had ended up dead. So that afternoon, Donna took detectives through the house, giving a detailed explanation of just what had happened. I walked him through my house, through the whole scene, with them videotape of me. Donna began her story in the bedroom, explaining how Danny had attacked her and how she had secretly grabbed her gun. And he bit me, and he told me to get up. 
Then she pointed out where Danny had taken her gun away and fired two shots, one into the floor and one into the far wall. And when I moved, the, my, my little um, thing fell on the floor and he seen the gun. And then he walked over to me and just grinned. He started laughing. And then he come behind me and took the gun. And I was kind of back. He took the gun, he was behind me and he shot it down the floor. Demonstrating how she had eventually gotten the gun away from Danny, Donna then led the detectives into the dining room. That's where she claimed the final showdown occurred. He said, Donna, I told you and I told anybody that if they're gonna point a gun at me, they better be ready to shoot it. And then he raised the gun up and he said, get ready. And he pointed the gun at me and his fingers started moving and I raised the gun up and I, and I shot it. That's how Donna said it happened. But the detectives were beginning to have doubts. Calling Donna back into the master bedroom, they asked about something she hadn't mentioned. A third bullet hole just above the headboard. Have you ever seen that before? I mean, would you no, I've never seen that before. If Danny had only fired two shots, one into the floor and one into the wall, then who fired the bullet into the headboard? Donna said she didn't have a clue. No, I don't have no idea. No idea. My house had probably 60 holes as big. Every door in my house had been thrown through their hollow cores. And they were talking about why I didn't know where one little hole was when in that one room there was probably eight holes that big. Donna told police that she had shot Danny in the doorway of the dining room, not in the bedroom. But with no bullet hole in the dining room wall, and an unexplained one in the headboard. Police were beginning to wonder if there was also a big hole in Donna's story. And if Donna's version of the shooting was starting to look doubtful, what about her more sensational claims? From the beginning, we're told Dan Fryman was possessed by the devil and that Donna Fryman was living in her own hell with her own devil. Donna claims she had proof to back up her story a series of journals and tapes documenting Danny's bizarre behavior. The police found them in the garage where she told them. But there was one tape Donna hadn't mentioned. Apparently moments after shooting Danny, Donna had turned on her tape recorder, catching part of the phone conversation with Gail that had eventually summoned the police. What? Get the police here now in an ambulance. I've shot the mother He's getting ready to die. Yeah, I'm safe. I got both guns. Yeah, he's laying on the ground. I had a gun on me, threatening my life. He bit me in my face. The tape recording covered the nearly 25 minutes before police had finally arrived. A 25 minutes in which Donna had vented her anger while Danny pleaded for help. You hear a dying Dan Fryman and Donna Fryman telling back to him, you don't love me. But is this a man that just tried to kill her? Or did she kill him and she's taunting him? It's not clear. After the abuse that she had suffered up to that point, I mean, she was, I don't know if shock would be the right word, but I mean, her conversation with him was not a friendly conversation. It was a kind of an emotional outpouring. When police asked Donna to explain why she had taped Danny's dying moments, she said that at first, she didn't realize she had hit him. He didn't fall, he didn't do anything. He disappeared. After Donna shot Dan, he roamed through the house. They found blood throughout the house. Donna said she had found herself out of ammunition, but she had been determined not to give up without a fight. I get my tape record thinking, okay, it's gonna be another night. You know, if, if the, you know, neighbors heard, police is going to be here. I'm going to get him on tape. By mid-March 2004, 
the results of the crime scene forensic tests were in. The police had agreed in this case that if Donna would cooperate and give a statement, they would not arrest her. They would allow the forensics to come back and determine if her statement was accurate before they made a decision on whether to charge her. The blood spatter evidence seemed to confirm Donna's account of the shooting. There was high velocity blood splatter found in that area, uh, and that's where she said she shot him. But despite a lack of similar blood evidence in the bedroom, the police remained focused on the unexplained bullet hole in the headboard and the lack of a bullet hole in the room where Donna had claimed she shot Danny. According to them, the fatal shot had to be fired somewhere other than where she had said she shot him. For that reason, they said based on the inconsistencies between her story and the forensics, uh, they felt the need to go forward and charge her. On March 18th, Donna Fryman was arrested for the murder of her ex-husband, Danny. And while her family scrambled to raise her bail, she settled into her decidedly less than designer surroundings. I ended up going to jail. I was there six weeks, sleeping on a filthy, dirty floor. Coming up, in court, the DA turns Donna's tapes against her. The prosecution was saying, listen to Donna taunting him. But is that the only tape the jury will hear? <laughs> On February 21st, 2006, almost two years after her arrest, an anxious Donna Fryman walked into Kentucky's Oldham County Courthouse to stand trial for the shooting death of her ex-husband, Danny Fryman. Charged with capital murder, the 38-year-old businesswoman faced life in prison if convicted. There was a great amount of interest in this trial. I think just the story of the night that he was killed, that story itself is what, what generated so much interest. In their opening statement, prosecutors painted Donna Fryman as a scorned woman bent on revenge. Unable to cope with Danny's infidelity and resentful that his actions had led to the downfall of their business, Prosecutors argued that Donna had shot Danny to death in a jealous rage. The motive, jealousy, and obsession. And what about Donna's journals and audio tapes chronicling Danny's abuse and odd behavior? According to the prosecution, they were nothing more than a meticulously constructed alibi. The prosecution told the jurors that Donna Fryman planned this. She wrote in journals. She had audio recordings of Dan, all trying to show that he was abusive, so when she killed him, she would have the excuse there waiting for her. But the defense painted an entirely different scenario. In his opening argument, Donna's attorney claimed she was not driven by jealousy, but by fear. Donna did these because she believed he was going to kill her. And she wanted the police to know who did it. The reason for it was it was somewhat therapy to her because she couldn't really tell anybody. He had threatened her if she told anybody or anybody confronted him that, you know, if he got it, if he went to jail, he would get out soon. And when he did, she would pay or family would pay. The result, according to the defense, was the violent confrontation early on the morning of January 12, 2004, that ended when Donna shot Danny in self-defense. He forced her to choose between living and dying. She chose life. That's why she's here today. The prosecution began its case by laying out the inconsistencies in Donna Fryman's story. Crime scene investigators testified that the bullet hole above the Fryman's bed seemed to indicate that Danny Fryman had been shot in the bedroom, not in the dining room, as Donna had claimed. There was one bullet hole in the house that could not be explained. The defense said, well, there were other bullet holes in the house that they didn't even look at. As evidence that Donna's motive was jealousy, the prosecution played the recording Donna had made after she shot Danny. It was just horrifying to listen to a man dying on a tape recorder. And the prosecution was saying, listen to Donna taunting him. Then, to further bolster their claim that Danny's death was payback for cheating on Donna, 
The prosecutors called Kim Luckett to the stand. She allegedly had an affair with Dan, and then Don and Dan got a divorce. Although in her testimony, Kim made the divorce sound inevitable with or without the affair. Their relationship was, um, I don't even know how to describe it really. They didn't really have, um, I mean, from what I saw, didn't have a good relationship. Um, there was verbal abuse constantly, um, physical abuse constantly, um, threats, demeaning comments. And according to Kim, Danny was the target, not the source of the abuse. She defended Dan Fryman. She said that Donna was the aggressor. There was an instance where she busted out the back of his car window when he was trying to drive away. And then there was a gun that she, um, she pulled out and never aimed it at me, um, but was <coughs> waving it around and, and threatening with it. The other woman in the affair testified that she pulled a gun on him on one occasion. So, so the, there were some witnesses that, that talked about threats Donna had made to him previously that were problematic for us. But on cross, Donna's attorney probed deeper into the affair, particularly its end. You just took off. No, I packed everything, shoved it into my car, and left. Got out as quick as you could, right? Yes. Because you were afraid of him. I was afraid of him, um, his lifestyle, her, and everything that went with it. Mm -hmm. And why was she afraid of Danny? You were afraid of him because he had physically abused you. That's correct. OK. And he also had told you that if you left him, he would hurt you. He did. And if he couldn't find you, he would find your family and hurt them. He did. In her testimony, Donna's sister corroborated her claim that Danny had violent tendencies and his conviction that he was controlled by a demon. He would call, make frequent call, phone calls to me at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, talk about how there was a demon that had been taking over his body and possessing him. Was it true? Did Danny believe he was possessed? Donna's defense hinged upon convincing jurors that her husband was unhinged. And all along, she claimed she had tapes that proved it. When you listen to the tapes, you'll understand. On one of the tapes, uh, Christmas night after, you know, he beat me all the way on the way home, told me I was going to die because I embarrassed him. But when her attorney proposed playing those tapes for the jury as part of Gail's testimony, the prosecution objected. We haven't authenticated it. We haven't tried to put it into evidence. However, the prosecution had entered all of the tapes into evidence, not just the one they had already played for the jury. Arguing for the right to play Donna's tapes in court, her attorney made the most of the oversight. They've introduced them. They're in evidence now. I can play every, I can play tapes that have been introduced by them. Judge, we have and put... they should have thought of that before they introduced them. The judge ruled in the defense's favor. The defense could play the tapes for the jury. Tapes they argued prove that Donna faced indescribable terror when Danny slipped into his demonic personality. It was one of the most terrifying things I've ever heard. It, it gave me nightmares after the trial started. You're listening to Dan Fryman and you're listening to him in bits of rage and just a tape that went on and on and on. And then at the end, the defense attorney looks at the jury and said, should she have been afraid? March 7th, 2006. More than two years had passed since Donna Fryman shot her ex-husband Danny to death in their home outside Louisville, Kentucky. She claimed it was self-defense and her attorneys had done their best to paint the dead man as a dangerous and delusional drug addict. The defense during the whole trial said she was abused for so many years and that they had such a violent relationship. The prosecution, on the other hand, had focused on the relationship's violent end. According to the case they had made to the jury, 
a mysterious bullet hole, and a chilling tape of Donna taunting Danny as he lay dying added up to murder. Was it murder? Was it self-defense? I think there was just a very thin line. Where the jury drew that line would determine whether Donna walked free or went to prison for life. After closing arguments that afternoon, they deliberated into the night. I thought there would be no way they could find her guilty, but, you know, it's a big system. You know, it could, it's a flawed system. Shortly before 11 p.m., the jury announced it had reached a verdict. And the tension mounted as Donna took her seat at the defense table. Never really got all that nervous until we walked in. They said they had a verdict. And that anxious feeling in Donna's stomach tightened further when the court clerk stood up to read the verdict. We, the jury, found the defendant not guilty. <laughs> All of a sudden, Gail, my whole family, friends, you can just hear them screaming. The nightmare was over. Weight had been taken off my shoulders, and it was over. I was trying to think like the jurors. And when they read that verdict, I thought, you know, this is right. And I didn't know until that moment. I wasn't sure if she was guilty or not guilty. But when they read that verdict, I felt relief. So I think deep down I realized, that I, thinking like the jurors, that she was not guilty. But while the trial, trauma, and years of torturous abuse were over, Donna faced a new struggle, rebuilding her life. I'm hoping something's going to click here real soon and me, you know, pick myself up and wipe myself off and, you know, do everything that I said I was going to do. That should help in domestic violence victims and helping people understand that it's it's, it's not what people think it is. 